Thank you all uh, for coming here. My name is Ben Valentino. I'm a professor uh, here in the government department, uh, and I'm also the faculty coordinator of the War and Peace Studies uh, Fellows Program here at the, the Dickey Center, where we're all uh, gathered. Today, it's uh, really my, my privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, Matt Gallagher. Matt's over here, um, who's going to talk to us about um, his new novel, uh, Young Blood. I see some of you uh, already have it, uh, and if you don't have it yet, uh, on the way out, uh, there's a stack of books from the Norwich Bookstore. Uh, you could pick up a copy, and I bet you can even convince Matt uh, to sign one for you. And I highly recommend um, that you do. Uh, the book just came out uh, on February 2nd, uh, so we're one of the first stops on what I think is going to be uh, a long and uh, triumphant uh, book tour. It's already been widely acclaimed. Matt's being compared uh, favorably to um, other war writers, including uh, Hemingway, uh, Tim O'Brien, uh, and Graham Greene, uh, uh, among others, so uh, quite a list of, uh, of people to be uh, uh, mixed in with. Let me give you a little background on Matt before I, I turn it over to him, and uh, he'll read uh, from the book and talk about some of his experiences. Matt attended uh, Wake Forest University, uh, where he joined Army ROTC, uh, I guess literally one week before 9-11, um, but he stuck with the decision, uh, even after it became clear that he was not going to be joining the, the peacetime uh, army, and his time with the army was likely to be very different than I think he must have expected when he signed up. He graduated from Wake Forest in 2005 and was commissioned as a second lieutenant. Um, he was then assigned to the 25th Infantry Division, which is based uh, in Hawaii. Um, and in 2007, he deployed uh, with the division to Iraq as a scout platoon leader. Um, he was promoted while in Iraq uh, in 2008 to the rank of captain um, and served as a targeting officer there until he returned to the United States in 2009. Later in the year of 2009, um, he left the army. While Matt was in Iraq, he, read, uh, he wrote one of the most uh, widely read uh, blogs uh, from the conflict, uh, which was called Kaboom. I remember reading it uh, when it was out. Uh, but unfortunately, that uh, blog lasted, I guess, less than a year um, uh, online before the higher-ups uh, shut it down. Uh, fortunately, though, uh, when Matt uh, got back to the States, um, he turned uh, the blog, along with some other writings, uh, into a memoir, which you can purchase also under the same uh, title, Kaboom. Uh, and that uh, book has also been very um, uh, reviewed very well, uh, so I recommend it. After Matt left the Army, um, he went on to write about the war for a variety of different publications um, and veterans issues as well, um, The Atlantic, The New York Times, uh, The Boston Review, uh, and many more. Uh, during this time, he also went back to school, uh, and in 2013, he got his MFA from uh, Columbia in fiction, so working on his craft. I just want to say one more thing uh, about uh, the book or uh, about why we had Matt up here before I turn it over to him. As many of you know, the War and Peace Studies program, along with other events uh, at the Dickey Center and uh, frankly a lot of the courses that I teach and, and some of my colleagues teach here, are designed to help our students try to grapple with the issues um, of war and peace, which uh, uh, especially war is to those of us who study it, remains kind of deeply mysterious um, in some ways. Why does it happen? What are its consequences? Um, and what can we do to prevent it? Uh, and if you've been to uh, events in this room before uh, uh, for the War and Peace Studies program or other Dickey Center events, you'll know that for the most part, the people we bring in here are, uh, for example, high-level policymakers, the people who make uh, the decisions uh, about uh, when and where and how the United States will fight. Um, and sometimes academics, people like me, um, who study various aspects of, of war, uh, ranging from just war theory, the ethics of war, uh, to the motives of terrorist organizations, to the grand strategies uh, of the United States and other uh, great powers. One thing, though, of course, that we can't really teach our, our students about is what the experience of war means to the individuals who we ask um, to fight those wars on our behalf. And if, <clears throat> if I'm honest, I should confess um, that I've always worried a little bit about how these high-level policies um, that we talk about in, in rooms like this or that are crafted in Washington, DC, or the academic theories uh, that we come up with in places like Dartmouth, how they translate to the realities on the ground 
in places like Iraq uh, that most of us have had the uh, good fortune not to ever have to um, uh, visit for ourselves. Um, and I was vividly reminded of that uh, concern when I read a scene in uh, the book where the main character, Lieutenant Porter, is given orders to offer um, condolence money, a large sum of condolence money, to two um, Iraqis whose cousin had been killed accidentally by U.S. troops at a, uh, at a roadblock a few days before. And uh, in the scene, Porter is struggling uh, with how he feels about this practice of paying condolence money, or what uh, Porter calls blood money. Uh, and so this is how Porter describes his thought, and I'll just read this quick uh, excerpt because it meant a lot to me. So uh, uh, he says, or he thinks, Porter, in theory, I wanted to emphasize with these men who'd lost a loved one to an ignorant, violent occupation they called the collapse. In theory, I found the exchange of blood money by any name in any culture to be abhorrent. In theory, my memories of their dead cousins, sundered intestines, and wailing mother meant more than just still shot photographs soaked in gore. In theory, in an air-conditioned classroom I'd once sat in with great clarity and wrath, I would grasp and grapple for a solution which bridged this vast divide because it was the right thing to do, because right things to do were worth grasping and grappling for, and not just in air-conditioned classrooms. In practice, though, things were different. They just were. So even though I can attest that at Dartmouth, our classrooms are definitely not air-conditioned, I will say that that passage hit uh, close to home for me. And so I asked Matt to join us here, in part because it's my hope um, that people like him and uh, books like Youngblood can help those of us who never will, uh, thankfully, experience the practice of war, um, will nevertheless uh, get a sense and be able to begin to understand uh, what it means to someone uh, who has, or those who we ask to experience it on our behalf. So we're grateful to have you here, Matt, and let me just turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, Professor Valentino, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction and, and, and for bringing me up, to, up here. It's, it's a real privilege uh, to be speaking here at Dartmouth. So uh, uh, before I, I read um, uh, some excerpts from the novel, uh, I'll just kind of give you a little background of, of how it came to be. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ben just read my bio. But uh, so 2011, I, I just started grad, grad school, and I was dead set on becoming a, a writer, uh, not a war writer. Uh, that that uh, I uh, you know I, I think no no human being wants to be reduced uh, or pigeonholed and, and I think writers are particularly prickly about that even though it's the most natural thing in the world I do I do it as a reader to other writers um, uh, but uh, you know being a hypocrite uh, uh, it doesn't doesn't make us wrong right uh, so uh, uh, you know I was writing a novel that had nothing to do with with Iraq or the military or war uh, but I was I was staying up. Um, at night watching the news. This was during the American withdrawal from Iraq. Uh, and, uh, you know, for uh, very obvious reasons, I was, I was very, very keenly interested in, in, in what was happening. Um, uh, you know, was, I was uh, interacting with this withdrawal the same way any American, like any other uh, American citizen. Um, uh, you know, the war had changed, the war had evolved. Uh, uh, I wasn't there anymore, so I, I wasn't sure what to trust or, or what to believe, but I knew I knew I was interested in, in something about those images of, of those last American strikers kind of cresting the sand berms uh, and rolling rolling south into Kuwait. Really kind of lingered, uh, really kind of stuck uh, stuck um, something in me, uh, and I was like, okay, maybe I'll maybe I'll do one short story just to uh, uh, get it out of my system or something. So. Uh, uh, that short story um, eventually became uh, this 300-page novel. So it, it, uh, just a long-winded way of saying, uh, you know, the subject uh, uh, wasn't done with me, despite my best attempts to be to be done with the subject. So, uh, uh, you know, that kind of that that image of uh, of uh, America's legacy uh, uh, and what it was leaving behind, both the people and, and, and kind of the country after nine years of, of war and occupation. Uh, or was was something I kept returning to as I as I drafted and redrafted and re rewrote uh, uh, this novel, um, both because it was the impetus for, for what what I wanted to the story I wanted to tell, 
uh, something bigger, uh, maybe with more breadth than, than what I'd done uh, with Kaboom, which was just kind of writing about one man's micro experiences, one Scaplatoon's micro experiences. Um, uh, so it wasn't just the impetus, but it was also the thing that I, I kept returning to uh, uh, to keep going, uh, just to, uh, uh, to, keep, to keep failing and keep failing and keep failing until, until maybe uh, 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 a passage or, or a chapter would, would, would finally click. So uh, enough of my preamble. Um, I'm going to start by reading uh, from, the, from the novel's prologue. It's strange, trying to remember now. Not the war, though that's all tangled up too. I mean the other parts. The way sand pebbles nipped at our faces in the wind. How the mothers glared when we raided houses looking for their sons. The smell of farm animal waste and car exhaust blending together during patrols through town, rambling aimless hours lost to the desert. How falafel bits got stuck between my teeth so much I started bringing floss on missions, along with extra ammo and water. The sun, the goddamn heat, the days I couldn't sleep and the nights I wouldn't. How the power of being in charge got to me, how it got to all the officers and sergeants, giant armed soldiers at our backs, ready to carry out foreign policy through sheer fucking force. How sometimes, many times, we were gentle the feeling of something, relief, gratitude, exhaustion, when a patrol returned to the outpost and for another day, we'd be able to ask ourselves, just what the hell were we doing? So little of Iraq had anything to do with guns or bombs or jihads. That's what people never understand. There was the desert and the locals and their lives. The way time could be vague and hazy one moment yet hard as bone the next. A lot of people ask, what was it like? And once, I even tried to answer. I was home with old friends. They meant well, and while they didn't want a perfect story, they wanted a clean one. It's what everyone wants, and I knew that. But it came out wrong. I started off about imperial grunts walking over a past we didn't know anything about but I could see their eyes glazing over, so I switched to the Haji kids playing in mud under bent utility poles, but that didn't work either. An anecdote about finding a sheik's porn collection earned some laughs, but by then I'd lost them, so I stopped. What's an imperial grunt, one asked later. They hope the seals get bin Laden? Kind of, I said, even though we hadn't. I miss it, which is a funny thing to think, until I remember otherwise. Like the daily purpose, I miss that, as messy as it could be. I miss the clarity of trying to survive, miss the soldiers, even miss the Mukhtar, who was honest enough to hate us, but still made us chai because we were guests. And her, of course. She comes in fragments, slivers of jagged memory that cut and condemn. How she'd sigh before we talked about the past, how my mind ached after we considered the future. I failed Rana, failed her utterly, all because I tried to help. What was it like? Hell if I know. But next time someone asks, I, wanna, I won't answer straight and clean. I'll answer crooked, and I'll answer long. And when they get confused or angry, I'll smile. Finally, I'll think, someone who understands. So that's the prologue. I'm going to go forward uh, a little bit um, to about maybe a third of the way into the book. Uh, it's actually right after the, uh, uh, the scene that, that Ben mentioned. Um, uh, there had been an accidental shooting at a, at a checkpoint. Um, uh, this is set uh, near the withdrawal from Iraq. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the war is supposed to be over, uh, even though there's this uh, very uh, dark uh, uh, violence kind of Lying, lying in wait, uh, seemingly kind of everywhere they turn. But, but this accidental shooting, it's kind of the, the first time it's kind of really kind of uh, reared, reared itself and, 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 and kind of returned. And there's a, there's a pervasive fear that, that uh, uh, the war is going to come back. Um, and uh, 
you know, most of the most of the American soldiers uh, on the ground are, uh, aren't aren't sure uh, how to reconcile with this. Um, but uh, so they're starting to kind of turn to to some of the hardened veterans who have been on multiple tours uh, for guidance. I walked outside to the back patio. Night was near, the mating call of beetles just shrill enough to rise above the nearby generators that powered the outpost. Four wood picnic tables sat on a concrete slab, each squad assigned a table, 40 men in sweat-starched uniforms ready to eat. I saw Sergeant Chambers at one of the far tables, so I took a seat at the nearest one, next to Doc Cork. Welcome to family dinner, sir, he said across from us. Smell that meat? Or it's because one of the cooks is old friends with Sergeant Chambers, celebrating his promotion. I turned to watch the goat rotate over the burn pit. It was plump, moving in slow revolutions, like a clock without a minute hand. Two Joes stood at each end of the goat, turning it with a steel rod held up by stakes. Burn pits were used for all sorts of refuse, from classified documents to used batteries, but it seemed suitable for roasting local cuisine, too. Cotton candy smoke billowed from the pit, drifting west. After waiting for the soldiers to cycle through the food line, I grabbed a plastic tray and heaped mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, and deviled eggs onto it, skipping the salad bowl. One of the cooks put chunks of tender pink goat meat on my plate. It smelled of heavy pepper. In theory, I detested the military-industrial complex that made things like fresh deviled eggs in the desert possible. It was wasteful. It was excessive. It further separated us from the townspeople we'd been charged with protecting. That was all true. In practice, though, indulgence filled stomachs and included ice cream for dessert. As I ate, I listened to the soldiers argue about whom they'd rather have sex with, Jessica Alba circa 2006 or Shakira 2008. Doc Cork said both of them were too skinny. He needed a woman with some meat on her, which sent the table into hysterics. Each of the tables hummed with similar banter. We rarely got together as an entire platoon anymore, and never at the outpost. Once dinner ended, I stood up on the bench and clapped my hands. Hotspur, I said. Settle down. Want to say it's great to be together in the same place since Kuwait. Two more things. Third and fourth squad, we still have that engineer escort tonight. Also, join me in recognizing our new platoon sergeant. Congratulations, Staff Sergeant Chambers. We're all looking forward to working with you in your new position. As the applause faded out, the men began chanting, the men began chanting, speech, speech. Chambers grinned, tucking his overbite behind his lower teeth and waited them out. A dim sky now hung over us, with only red lead flashlights and the blaze from the pit illuminating the area. Someone tended to the fire with lighter fluid, swelling the flames wide and red. Chambers moved in front of the pit to speak. Because of the slight incline of the hill, and the way the flames danced shadows up and down his silhouette, he seemed a pastor delivering a dark sermon. The pealing cadence in his voice reinforced it. Wayward souls these soldiers were, but not beyond his redemption. Not yet. I want to tell you all a story. A war story, he said. Listen to it. Learn from it. The best soldier, the best man I ever knew was a non-com named Elijah Rios. We deployed here together a couple years ago. He was bona fide, a real warrior. I owe everything to him. He saved my life. His eyes moved from man to man in slow consideration. Before we left, we thought we were steel. But even those of us who deployed before didn't know what hard was yet. Our platoon sergeant, he had an idea. Kept saying it wouldn't be like the invasion or Afghanistan, that the war had changed, evolved. Kept calling his young bloods, trying to get us focused. We thought it was a big joke. Ha fucking ha. He was right. Things were raw. Got hit every day. Daisy chain IEDs, snipers, even a female suicide bomber once. This was before the generals bought off the insurgency, before the sheiks turned on Al Qaeda. It was everyone against everyone, and everyone against us. Got intel one night that an Al-Qaeda group had moved into a Shia neighborhood, going around and executing people, trying to get everyone to vacate so Sunnis could move in. 
Didn't think much of it. It was happening all over Iraq, on both sides. Just another mission, we thought. Didn't know the exact house they were in, just the block. So we sent the whole company. Sent inner cordon, outer cordon, whole nine yards. But anyone worth a fuck wanted to be kicking down doors, going house to house. That's where I was. That's where Elijah was. First eight or nine houses were all dry holes. Tenth house, everything went to shit. First room, we found a guy loading an RPG behind a couch. We shot him in the face, but then all his buddies knew we were there. That fatal funnel and doorways you hear about when you learn how to clear rooms? No joke. Took three squads for that one house. Eight enemies spread across five rooms. Eight. Killed them all. Three wounded, one dead on our side. Should have just blown the house up with a tank round, but higher wouldn't clear it. Collateral damage, they said. So it was up to us, the grunts, the trigger pullers, the goddamn infantrymen. That's why we're here, gentlemen, to do what no one else can, when no one else will. Somehow, someway, we pushed our way upstairs. Couldn't make sense of anything. Everything was too dark or too bright in the night vision. A grenade went off. Couldn't hear, neither. Three of us stacked outside one of the last rooms and reloaded. There was no door, and we could hear a voice on the other side, fucking with us. Say what you will about Al-Qaeda, but they weren't cowards. Not the real ones. I went in first and saw a flash of light, of movement, in a corner. So I turned that way. I shot twice, and glass exploded everywhere, falling to the ground. Shots came from behind at the same time. All I could think was, fuck, I'd been had. The bastard had set up a mirror so I'd go that way, chasing his reflection. He had a clean shot at the back of my skull. If the guy behind me hadn't recognized that, I'd be dead. If the guy behind me hadn't pulled his trigger faster than Hodge pulled his, I'd be dead. That guy was Elijah. I didn't know what to say. I think I just sputtered out thanks or some shit. He just looked at me and nodded. I got you, young blood, he said. I got you. I no longer heard the Beatles or the generators, and neither did anyone else. My right leg twitched and twitched, and I swallowed loud, looking around to see if anyone had heard me. Chambers continued. Elijah had a philosophy he lived by. De presso liber. Anyone hear that before? Even if someone had, no one spoke. Means liberate the oppressed. It's the motto of the Green Berets. Elijah planned on joining them after our tour. He didn't just say it either. Had it tattooed on his chest. He fucking meant it. He fucking lived it. Someone in the shadows shouted, preach, which was echoed a few times. Chambers pressed on. Some of the squad leaders here know what I'm talking about. They saw it too. Humvees swallowed in fire, bod bodies liquefied by metal and heat, all because of a wrong turn or a gunner not spotting a wire fast enough. The sound of helicopters, attack birds moving from Camp Independence sliced through the night. Rather than let, let them interrupt his benediction, Chambers raised his hands, palms up, and absorbed them into it, the roarders his very own monk chants. It all seemed quite natural somehow. It really did. Hear that? He shouted over the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh of the blades. Savage. That's what this is all about. Staying alert. Staying ready. Staying vigilant. They're going to get some before they get got. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes as the birds flew south toward Baghdad. His head drooped down. Seconds passed in a shrouded hush. Then one of the Joes up front quietly asked what had happened to Elijah Rios. Chambers opened his eyes and smiled. His voice lowered, and I couldn't tell if he was betraying the quiet sort of rage that lingers within men after something vital, something matchless breaks, or just faking the same. Dead, Chambers said, because he didn't stay vigilant. Even he. I'm telling this story to show how it can happen to anyone if you let down your guard, even for a moment. Don't think that because the war seems over that it is. Right now, right now, out there, men are plotting to kill you, to kill your friends. And like those birds, the only way we make sure that don't happen is to get some before they do, 
You hear me, Hotspur? Hoo! The platoon grunted in unison. I said you fucking hear me? Hoo! They were louder this time. Fiercer, too. I wasn't sure if Chambers was done. Part of me hoped so. Part of me didn't. Something blossomed out of the dark near the pit. It crawled under the firelight, then down the hill, capturing Chambers' attention. He raised his boot and then thought otherwise. Get a cup, he said, one of the large ones. It was a camel spider. I'd seen them before, at a distance though, not like this. Yellow with brown fur, it was thick like a cigarette pack. It kept poking its front pincers and gaping angry jaws at us as we passed around the cup. Some sort of insect blood, probably beetle, was splattered across its mouth like a child's art project. Men, Chambers said from the other side of the fire. Heard some of you caught a scorpion at the front gate. True? Alphabet nodded. Bring him down, Chambers continued. What better way to end the night than a prize fight? They set up a ring next to the bonfire, a cardboard box with its bottom pushed open. They dumped the camel spider in first, and it poked the walls of its new prison, all four corners and two square feet of it. Testosterone bogged the air, and red flashlights flitted over the ring like police sirens. I looked around and didn't see jaded boredom anymore, but something else. I wondered if I should stop the fight. I was the lieutenant. I decided not to. I wondered if I should leave the fight. I didn't. No need to be queasy. Chambers spoke to me from across the ring. A red light shined up from a wristless face on, from a wristless fist onto his face. Your man T. Lawrence did this. It's a proud tradition. All good, I grinned. Who you got? Scorpion, he said. He must have smelled the stink of easy money on me. You thinking spider? Everyone knows the scorpion always wins, I said. I'm not that green. He winked. Guess not. How long do you think the spider will last then? I'm in a betting mood. The soldiers crowded around us, shouting suggestions, picking sides. I studied the two combatants. The camel spider was at least twice as big as the scorpion. Besides, I reasoned, it would take time for the scorpion's venom to seep into the spider's bloodstream, or whatever circulatory system spiders have. Two minutes, I said. I'll take the under, Chambers replied. Hundred bones? I nodded. I had faith in the big ugly. Most of the soldiers did not. I looked around and, intentional or not, nearly all of them had slid over to Chambers' side of the ring and the scorpions. Through the firelight, I spotted a friendly face. A two medicine man? Sorry, Doc Hork said. Like you said, sir, everyone knows the scorpion wins. I nodded again and felt a hand on my shoulder. I'm with you, sir. I turned around and found Alphabet st standing behind me, heavy slotted gaze holding steady. What's two minutes? Then he burped loud and proud, reeking of digested goat. I'd never loved another man more. Dropped from its jar, the scorpion landed on its feet, and the camel spider went straight at it, jaws wide, fangs bared. Under a spotlight of red incandescence, the camel spider tried to pierce the scorpion's exoskeleton with its pincers the scorpion bobbing and weaving to keep clear of the spider's bloody furnace of a mouth. The smaller creature was soon boxed into a corner, maintaining leverage due to a jagged pebble. I needed the spider to stop being so aggressive, but asking an arachnid to go gorilla and outlast its opponent rather than murder it as soon as possible seemed pointless, so I just shook my fist and howled. Similar sounds emanated from around the ring. The camel spider sank its front pincers into the top of the scorpion's shell and began pulling it into its jaws, a long, slow death march. I howled again, something resembling the word yes rising from the wilds of my chest. The camel spider began gnawing on the scorpion's head. The arthropod held, held off ingestion by ramming its claws against the bulk of the spider and shoving, a sort of dark arts horizontal push-up. Then it raised its trident. My eyes snapped wide as the tail moved back and forth, to and fro. The spider stopped chewing, hypnotized. Like a black lightning bolt, the scorpion plunged its stinger down into the camel spider, straight through a bulbous eye. A horrifying rattle followed, something like a leaking balloon, and the camel spider collapsed on its belly, pincers out. Time? someone asked. 
80 seconds, Doc Cork said, reading from the digital green of his wristwatch. Team Scorpion wins. I bellowed bitterly as Chambers and most of the platoon cheered and crowed. Seamen, Chambers said, that's what happens when you hesitate. A motherfucking stinger comes for your brain. Don't be the camel spider. Be the scorpion. The scorpion freed itself from the dead spider's jaws and took a victory lap around the dirt ring, claws raised. I accepted Alphabet's offer of a cigarette, even though I didn't smoke. Chambers asked if I could pay him next time we made a run to Camp Independence, and I said yes. Then he used two cups to collect the scorpion and started walking to the perimeter gate. The soldiers protested, saying they wanted their prize fighter for future bouts. Keep a scorpion as a pet? Chambers yelled behind him. Do I look crazy to you? He tossed the scorpion, cup and all, over the gate and into the desert. Some of the men kept grumbling, but it had been done. There was nothing left to do but search for a new contender, if they cared to. I lingered at the burn pit for an hour. Soldiers drifted into the outpost, two or three at a time, calling each other youngbloods, telling one another to be the scorpion. Only Alphabet remained. Perhaps sensing my mood, he stayed quiet. I caught my way through the first cigarette and then asked for another. As I watched the fire smolder into loose petals of ash, I couldn't shake the feeling that I just lost something important, something that mattered, even if it was just a pretense of that something. I pulled an assault glove from a cargo pocket and picked up the spider from the ring, holding it in front of me. A thick green jelly oozed from the hole in its eye. Thought it was tougher than it was, Alphabet said, walking close to steady the carcass himself. Tricked us into thinking that too. I tossed the camel spider into the burn pit. The desert seemed still, placid. I spat onto the ground and tried to sound ironic. Inshallah, I said, as God wills it. Yeah, Alphabet said, something like that. Thank you. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, um, or I could just ramble up some more. But I, 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 I know I always enjoy the Q and A exchanges far more. So, and I, I think, uh, 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 and I hope you all do too. So, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. in Iraq and um, the gist of it was that um, some of the toxic substances that have been burned over there were resulting in uh, injuries to American soldiers and probably Iraqi civilians. And I wondered if you wanted to comment on that, if you knew anything about that. Uh, just a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, the, the VA set up a registry uh, and has encouraged the uh, veterans of Iraq to sign up for it. Uh, there's been more and more cases, uh, particularly lung-related issues and diseases, uh, excuse me, uh, tied to these burn pits. Um, uh, thus far, it kind of seems like it'll, it'll be our generation's version of, of Gulf War syndrome. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it, we'll see. I, I, I don't know if it's gonna be on the scale of like a, the Agent Orange effects on, on Vietnam veterans. Um, but it's a real issue, and it, it's kind of uh, uh, on a personal level. It's that's for me. It was just kind of like, oh, we're uh, uh, we're real vets now. Uh, there's you know something un unexplained that uh, uh, um, you know the big big military or the U.S. government maybe wasn't tracking or, or didn't let us know about fully. Um, uh, in a way, it's almost like a perverted tradition, per per a perverse tradition uh, 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 to be a part of. You know, we're no longer. Um, uh, you know, kind of the young, uh, in, uh, uh, inver invernable soldiers that you, that you never are, but that you think you are, that anybody thinks they are, particularly young men in their early 20s. Um, I know it's, I have friends that, are, that have been affected by it, and, and uh, 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 um, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out um, the root cause and, 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 and the treatments for it, and, and I mean, it's awful to say, but it's it's like, uh, is often the case. It's, it seems to be affecting the the lower level soldiers most, right? Because they're the ones actually tasked with with dealing with the burn pits. I you know, I was I was I was a junior officer. Uh, I just 
passed that order along and, and went back to writing my patrol order or my patrol debrief. Um, it's, it's really the, you know, it's the 19, 20 year old kids who enlisted right out of high school or, or maybe the, the 30 year old that, that uh, um, felt, a, felt a calling uh, to serve his country and, and, and went down to the local recruiter office. You know, it's, it's those young privates, those privates and specialists that seem to be bearing the burden of, of this the most. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's awful, it's very sad. Um, and uh, at the same time also perversely not unexpected. Yeah. Maybe I'll just take this opportunity to ask you to reflect a little bit about what's happened to Iraq um, in the years since you were there. Um, and I'm not asking you to prognosticate about what will happen eventually or even why it happened, but I'm kind of more interested in how you feel about that as someone who, who served and fought uh, for a different place than the one that it is, whatever else you might say about it. I don't think anybody wanted um, the Iraq we have today. Um, but as somebody who, who risked something and saw others um, sacrifice a lot um, to try to bring about a different outcome in, in Iraq, uh, what does it mean to see the place um, becoming what it is uh, today, to think about us uh, going back um, as is being discussed and as we have, uh, at least with small units, so how does that, how, I, I imagine that's something you've, you've thought about. I'd love it if you'd share those thoughts with us. Yeah, no, it's, it's a whole gamut of emotions. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's almost quaint now to think about that, almost quaint, but in 2009 when my unit went back to Hawaii, we, we thought we'd won the war, right? It, uh, it was kind of the end of the surge. Uh, in, in our town, uh, it, you could notice, there were noticeable differences in terms of the, you know, the first three months we'd been there, it seemed like there was a, a car bomber or a shooting every every day and every night. Um, it, it was you know it wasn't uh, the uh, burgeoning democracy that that uh, maybe Rumsfeld and Cheney had had aspired for in '03, uh, but it was relatively stable. It was relatively peaceful. We were opening schools. The electricity uh, was was stable. It, there was a a, very, a legitimate cautious sense of optimism. Um, you know, in, in the back of your head, or at least the back of my head. I don't want to speak for. Um, you know, the, my fellow my, my fellow soldiers over there. You know, there was always this concern of um, can it last? Can it uh, can this sustain? Particularly w with without uh, uh, armed American soldiers at every at every corner. Um, you know, a big part of the the surge and the counterinsurgency and the, uh, uh, the the Sunni awakening and all these all these nice terms. A lot of it was you know essentially hiring armed guards, many of whom were, were former Al Qaeda, and calling them the, the sons of Iraq. Right. Um, uh, which came with all sorts of complications. Um, I mean, it was easier for me, on, on somebody on his first tour, to, to let bygones be gone, but um, I understood why some of my sergeants who were on their second or third tour um, had deep, mis deep misgivings about that alliance. But, uh, you know, at the time, it was, we felt like it was for the greater good, and we really didn't have any other options. Um, uh, you know, looking back on it, um, you know, pushing a country back from the brink of a civil war um, was it was it something worth trying to do? Now, yeah, we were uh, uh, almost entirely responsible for bringing the, that country in place to to that brink. Um, but you know, you can't when you're in the midst of everything, uh, you, you can't get bogged down by those thoughts. You're, you're just trying to go out every patrol, and, and, you know, try to uh, try to help this town. Try, you know, try to try to do right by your soldiers. So yeah, we, we came back in in uh, 2009 and. and we felt like the war had been won, or whatever winning a war like this is. Uh, obviously, that's not uh, what what has since transpired, and and um, uh, you know, I think a lot of that sorting through these feelings were, was a lot of the reason I I wrote the novel was it, it was so complicated, it was so messy. I I couldn't exactly pin pinpoint how how I felt, and on one hand, I you know I'm, you're devastated, uh, you know, growing up. Um, uh, uh, you know, as, an, as a millennial American, uh, you don't hear much about the Vietnam narrative or the Vietnam story, or you, you know, you, you hear about it, but that's not the story that is reinforced. It's the World War II, save save the world for democracy story, right? And uh, uh, you know, even even going over to Iraq, you knew that this was a very minor thing compared to that. But but you know, it, it, uh, it 
to deeply impressionable young people, that, that has a huge effect. Uh, so then you, you, know, you start to reconcile that, oh, this, this is really not a little World War II, this was a, this was a little Vietnam. And then, you know, then you get to the point, well, who cares about my personal, my personal uh, 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 devastation? It's nothing, I have all my fingers and toes. Uh, I, you know, I'm sad that my, my war didn't turn out the way it wanted, who cares? Um, you know, millions, millions of Iraqis have been displaced. Uh, 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 thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, have, have been killed uh, because of this, uh, because of our invasion and occupation. Um, uh, the, the, you know, five thousand American troops were killed. Um, you know, many of whom probably joined up the same time I did after 9/11, thinking that there was going to be some kind of, you know, generational calling. That this was an important moment and and. We were in a unique place in history to, to, to serve our country um, for a greater good. Uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands have you know lost limbs or or, or suffer from from post traumatic stress uh, or, uh, or uh, you know have, have tra uh, traumatic brain injuries. Um, so who cares about Matt, Matt Gallagher uh, uh, feeling sad about it? Um, it's 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 nothing. Um, so. Uh, you know, all of that's kind of swirling, swirling in your head, and, and I, I think that's part of the reason why, you know, I, I sat down and wrote Youngblood. I felt like that withdrawal in 2011 was it was kind of a key moment to maybe look back at the previous nine years and uh, uh, have a fictional reckoning, essentially, of what had transpired, uh, and, and kind of the, the legacy and inheritance of armed conflict, right, and, and how the consequences of that can never really be, be planned for, let alone contained. And how um, how that armed conflict, how those consequences um, uh, affects uh, 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 not just individual souls, but but communities at large uh, for for long after um, uh, uh, the events, uh, both both the the combatants, right, uh, the, you know, the characters in the book, as in real life, will will carry these uh, carry this experience and, and carry these uh, these battles with them home, right, uh, and. Uh, the local Iraqi characters, as in real life, are, are still living in the midst of it. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's a few combat sequences in the book, but I was I was really far more interested in exploring kind of the after effects of that that of that armed violence and and and, and how that resonated um, uh, in in almost always unintended uh, and unforeseen ways. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I think that just mirrored my my journey as I was sorting through my own feelings. Uh, watch, you know, watching the news and keeping apprised with things, both as a veteran, but also there was this point when I realized I was more interested in these things just as an American citizen, right? But as a taxpayer who, who you know, the, the young men and women now serving in uniform are, are representing me the same way they're representing everyone here wearing that American flag. Um, uh, you know, and, and we are a republic, uh, and, and even though it's, it may not always seem that we, uh, our, our military uh, works for us. They do. They're, that's how it's supposed to work. Um, so uh, you know, it's a really long-winded, rambling answer. But uh, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think because I had all these uh, uh, different thoughts and, and, and feelings, I, I just needed to sit down, to sit down, and write through it. And uh, I'm very much kind of a, a, like a lot of writers. I think I, I write to figure out exactly how I feel. Um, you know, uh, uh, putting it, putting words on a page, stringing sentences together. Give some sense and order, um, uh, you know. Uh, though, uh, as as my friends and wife will attest, I've also been known to, to rant at the pub uh, after a couple beers too. That 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 can that can that can help give sense and order in a, in a different way sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> there were a couple of um, uh, parts of your reading that, that jumped out at me when you were describing the enemy. At one point, you said all kinds of they're not cowards. And there was another part where you talked about setting up the mirror. So there's this sort of clever. Um, trap that was being set. Um, so I, I don't know if that's representative of our, but it, it seemed that you were trying to convey uh, to the reader an image of the enemy or trying to shape the reader's perceptions of, of what that consists of. And, and, and I just wonder, um, was that intentional or in general, or are you trying to convey some, some image of the enemy to readers? Uh, or, or if not, sort of what's your perception of the people you were fighting against in Iraq? How did it change your perception? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, 90. 5% of the time, the, the people that I, I was dealing with in 2007, 2008 were, were angry teenagers uh, who were you know, either trying to avenge a, a, a 
lost father or a, 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 a you know killed brother, um, uh, or uh, you know, or in their minds, we're, we're protecting their local town uh, and village from the from the foreign occupiers. Um, so yeah, you know, there's a bit you know intellectually you want to empathize with that, but also in the moments they're planning roadside bombs trying to kill you, they're they're taking pot shots with AK-47s from roofs. There's only empathy can only go so far, at least in the moment. Um, that said, there there uh, um, there were you know diehard uh, uh, jihadists uh, that often weren't necessarily Iraqi, right? Like Zarqawi, I believe, was of Jordanian descent. Um, there were a lot of Saudis there, um, uh, uh, and that kind of interested me. That that the, the a lot of times when I was a tar once I made CAP and became a targeting officer, I realized that the uh, the, the guys the, the the street punks that we've been chasing down on the on the ground were kind of low level fish. I mean, you, you get them if you can, but they're they're not the ones you're after. Once once I got to that the company level, I realized that uh, 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 the challenges it's not unlike being a uh, uh, being a beat cop busting up a drug ring. Um, you know, I watched The Wire in, in Iraq, and I was like, this has way too much in common. Uh, this Band of Brothers has nothing. You know, you watch Band of Brothers thinking that that's what you're going to uh, uh, identify with, but no, it was The Wire. Uh, you're trying to track down these kind of these uh, uh, mid-level, high-level, sometimes insurgents who uh, were smart. They didn't have any guns on them. Uh, you know that they had all their paper, fake papers in check. Um, you're tracking them that way uh, 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 was much more difficult and challenging. But ultimately, when you got them, or some, you know, occasionally got them, it was it was also very fulfilling. So uh, you know that uh, uh, I was there in 07 and 08. So. I, in a way, as the author, I kind of served as a as a bridge between these two uh, narratives. Um, you know, I, one of the ambitions I had with the novel was to tell. I didn't want to tell a micro story. Um, uh, you know, it was a nine year war. I, you know, I I knew I couldn't maybe tell a, a a narrative about the entirety of that nine year war and occupation. But I wanted something with some breadth and some some fullness, some some sense of totality. So that's kind of what led me to this this bi level narrative idea. Is is at, is at once. In 2010, 2011, the withdrawal, looking back with with Jack Porter, but also this other story, this mystery involving Chambers and and uh, Elijah Rios and, and 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 Rana, the Sheik's daughter, uh, in in 2006, which was kind of the height of the sectarian wars, um, and you know, I think a lot of that was my own interest in in in, in both of these times, uh, being uh, what immediately preceded my units and and what what I saw and directly experienced. And then what uh, uh, what happened after, right? Like like what our how we shaped uh, the trajectory of the war. So uh, um, uh, it was a lot of fun uh, because it, uh, it forced me out of the, you know what David Foster Wallace called the, the tiny skull kingdom of, of my own brain. Uh, and you know, I did a lot of research, uh, uh, read a lot of journalism uh, about both of these these times um, uh, to get a, to get a deeper sense of. Uh, the Iraqi's perspective of the everyday Iraqi experience of, of uh, I, I, I came across a lot of oral histories, like kind of like the Stubbs Tur Turkle style or oral histories that were very very helpful. Um, and you know, like it, it seems obvious now, but at the time, you know, I've been doing it here, right? We have all these neat terms: sectarian wars, the surge, the invasion, the withdrawal, right? And it's, it's a way of for us to try to give some sense and order. Uh, uh, to this, for, for for the everyday Iraqi, uh, it was all part of the same mess, right? It didn't matter that the a new American unit was coming in; they they they'd seen it all, right? It was just okay. Now now I got to deal with a different different personality. These guys have a lightning bolt patch. Those guys had a horse patch, whatever. Um, and that, I mean, it, it was all part of the collapse, right? It was just all part of the same mess, uh, and and still is at least in parts of the country. And that was uh, uh, again. It seems obvious, uh, but at the time, it was uh, it was a moment for me of like taking a step back and being like, oh, okay, that's really interesting. Um, uh, and let me chew over that both as a person, but let, let me also as the writer write that in my notebook because you know, then I can you know I think I can shape something interesting uh, in in the in the book I'm trying to write about that. So uh, uh, I'm bringing this back to the enemy, which was the question. Um, you know, kind of. Uh, I keep using the word fullness and dimensionality and, and introducing different enemy characters, classic uh, uh, you know, enemy, uh, in, in different ways. There's, there's an older uh, jihadi that it very much is 
uh, similar to, to Zarqawi, right? And, and, and he's kind of in the shadows, but he's, uh, you, I think, figure out by the end of the novel that, that he's been controlling a lot of the, a lot of the events. Um, the guys they spend, this American platoon spends most of the time chasing down, uh, you know, uh, 17, 18 year old kid uh, who has his reasons uh, uh, for, uh, for attacking American troops. At the same time, he's, he's attacking American troops. So, uh, you, you know, you, you, you gotta deal you got to deal with the guy uh, carrying the gun right in front of you. So, um, you know, I, I wanted that complexity to be that I I I found both in my own direct experiences and then in my research um, uh, to be portrayed uh, as vividly as possible in, in the novel. Yeah. How were your encounters with the Iraqi civilians? Uh, all over the you know kind of ran the gamut. I mean, it really a lot of it just kind of depended on the circumstances. I mean, I, I do remember very. Uh, first or second week, realizing, trying to trying to view them through our or their eyes, trying to view us through their eyes, you know, because in my head I was twenty three, um, uh, you know, I shaved once a week, right? Like I got, you know, I kind of gotten by or gotten to that point in my life mostly on boyish charm, right? And realizing, wait a minute, I'm I'm in ar I'm armored, I'm wearing Rambo sunglasses, I'm carrying a a big ass rifle. Of course they're getting, of course they're looking at me like that, right? Like, let me reassess, you know, and, and just you know, try to have some perspective on that. Um, on, on the other, you know, sometimes you know, uh, you became you become close, you know, and, and, and you know, I, 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 you friendly, you know, I, you know, I think friends is, is per perhaps way too strong of a term, but you know, ch check in with the barber uh, every week, get get a haircut, you know, talk. You know, much like a beat cop, right? Just like talk. What's what's going on? What are you hearing in in town? Um, uh, get to know the, the guy that runs the falafel shop. Um, but then you know, then you know, part of your job is, is going on raids at midnight and, and kicking down doors and, and trying to track you know trying to track down these you know I, I mentioned it I referenced it in the prologue, trying to track down these nineteen and twenty year old kids who were who were uh, uh, killing killing fellow soldiers or killing Iraqi policemen. Uh, and then you know he's not there, but his mother's there. Uh, his his grandfather is there, who's uh, who's on you know on dialysis. Um, so you know, kind of having to shift that gear, like instantly you know instantly ramping down from you know raiding a house, thinking uh, somebody's waiting to, to shoot at you, uh, and then realizing no, um, uh, it's just his family. Let's uh, 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 let's talk to them. Let's. Um, uh, Give them, you know, give them a phone number. Say, please call us, even though you never will. And and uh, um, yeah, so it was just kind of a, a it was all over the place. Um, I'll I'll say this, and, and a lot of it was luck and circumstance, um, certainly. But something I, I I remain deeply proud of, and it's it's less a testament to me than it than it was um, my uh, uh, my sergeants who were who were very professional. Uh, not one of my soldiers in the course of fifteen months, despite getting shot at, despite dodging roadside bombs, uh, uh, never raise their weapon in, in anger. It, it's something, it's a small thing, uh, especially, you know, in light of the, the, the entirety of the war and the devastation it wrought. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's something, it's something. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in many ways, our, our experience ourselves was a story of where everything went right, right? It was the right people, right people in the right leadership positions. Uh, all, all the soldier, all the men came home. Uh, one was only one was seriously wounded, but that even that was in a, a freak non-combat accident. Uh, you know, in many ways, I think the story of young blood is a story of a platoon where everything goes wrong, goes wrong, right? And, and what happens? Uh, not not just uh, uh, in the physical moment, but what? How does that erode uh, 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 individuals' morals and ethics? How does that erode the the collective uh, morals and ethics of, of a group? Um, so uh, you know, and, and uh, similarly to, to get back to you, to your question, like w w what is how does nine years of, of occupation and war uh, what does that do to an Iraqi town? What does that do to individual Iraqi uh, uh, people who uh, uh, you know? Um, in, in I think that's best reflected in, in the Sheikh's daughter Rana, who in myth that uh, uh, is just you know she's just a beautiful teenage teenage girl. But when we finally get to meet her. You know, it's five or six years after after that myth has, has been set up, and, and she's a survivor. You know, she, she's she's much more complex, and, and and has her own set of motivations and, and goals and purposes. 
uh, because this war has taken everything from her, uh, but she's still, she's still trying to get by. She still has two young, young children uh, uh, to raise in this world and is, is trying to do the best with, with what she's been given. So, um, you know, I, I think I, I know I reflected uh, a lot on my own individual experiences with uh, a variety of Iraqi civilians as I developed her, her and other characters. Uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering in particular about the Iraqi character, the Barbie kid. What was your inspiration for creating him? Yeah, he's, he's great. Um, uh, he was one of my favorite characters to write because it, it, kind of similarly to what I was just saying about Rana, I wanted to uh, uh, introduce a character that, that um, uh, he's, a, he's a young young teenager, 13 or 14 or so, that, that sells uh, uh, porn and, and energy drinks to the to soldiers and, and to local Iraqis. Uh, and he's an orphan. Um, uh, uh, and that, you know, just kind of roams around town. And it, it, it gave me, you know, the, the, the writerly answer to your questions, it, it, it gave me a character that could always be doing something in, in each of the different places uh, of, of Asharia. Uh, but the character, uh, I, I wanted to uh, show the war is, is all he's known, right? Uh, 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 for his, much, of his, much of his life, certainly all, his cogn all of his cognitive life, uh, America uh, has been, uh, the American military has been armed uh, uh, in, in his country. Um, and I wanted to show uh, or ha have somebody who that war has taken everything from him Yet he, yet he's still out there enduring. He's he's still out there uh, uh, trying to hustle, trying to get by, um, and uh, you know it also was a vehicle of, of kind of showing. Um, uh, you know he didn't he doesn't know anything else, right? So uh, you know unlike maybe some of the American characters who are who are young, who can reflect back to to their their past and their homes where there isn't is an armed conflict. Uh, uh, this is this is what uh, uh, nothing but war, uh, uh, you know, can do to a young a, a young person. In many ways, I think the Barbie kid has uh, more in common with with Chambers, so with Sergeant Chambers, than, than any of the other Americans, because Chambers is on his fourth tour. You know, in many ways, Chambers is kind of the the uh, ultimate uh, example of what perpetual war uh, can 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 do to a person, um, and, and kind of the, the moral and ethical compromises they will make. Uh, 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 and, you know, so in some ways, that they're almost kindred spirits that way. Um, uh, and also, I just kind of wanted to have a little color, all right? Like, have, have, I thought it was uh, it'd be a good visual for readers to have a have an angry, sullen Iraqi teenager uh, uh, who wears pink sweats, rolling rolling around, selling porn and energy drinks. Like, uh, it just it, it, I was like, this this you know this feels right on the page. Well, I have a lot of questions. I, I think the one that's, I have two related questions. You started the preface uh, with the uh, trying to talk to people afterwards about the experience and, you know, trying to give a story. And, and I guess um, that connects to the images that the American public has in its mind about the conflict. They have an image, maybe, or maybe there's many images. And I think back to uh, sort of Vietnam and, you know, a lot older. I grew up in a period where people had a specific image of Vietnam and what a Vietnam vet was and mm -hmm. what they had experienced. And a lot of that is has no relationship at all with what actually happened. And and some of the fiction that came out of Vietnam was an attempt to some of it reinforced that that you know it's the rice paddy, it's the Hendrix, and it's the, it's smoking dope, and it's 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 fragging your it's fra fracking your free crew lieutenant, you know that kind of stuff. And, uh, and a lot of it was actually, so anyway, I'm just wondering if you have uh, in mind images that might be at large in the public uh, about this that you find to be very misleading or, or inaccurate or just untrue or unfaithful to the actual experiences you, as you understand. Do you see metaphors and images when people talk about this war that you find objectionable and would like to correct? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I think the the first thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, in, in some ways, uh, like you know, American Sniper has kind of been the biggest lightning, like touchstone uh, for for how American society interacts with with at least Iraq, if if not uh, uh, all the post nine eleven uh, 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 
military uh, endeavors. Uh, and uh, in some ways, you know, uh, uh, my, my meta take of it was, well, at least it got people talking. But then my visceral take in the midst of it was, I think there was three or four Iraqi children characters in, on that film, not on the screen very often. Uh, and all three or four of them were either uh, directly terrorists, and, you know, carrying mortar rounds or, or, uh, or, or carrying AKs, or uh, 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 informing on the whereabouts of, of American troops. Uh, uh, you know, I, and, that, and that, that, that really bothered me. Um, and uh, 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 even though, you know, it's, it's a story of, of one, one Navy SEAL sniper, um, you know, uh, who, who uh, you know, uh, uh, Christ, I'm glad he was on my, you know, I'm glad he was wearing the same uniform I was. You know, I, I'd feel a lot better if, if, knowing that there was a Chris Kyle uh, on a roof overwatching me. I, I don't need him to talk like an English professor. Um, if anything, I kind of wish Eastwood hadn't sanitized him. Uh, you know, I, I, I wish you know, the, the real Chris Kyle, the one that, you know, claimed to have been on the super dorm during the New Orleans, during Katrina, you know, kind of the lying braggart side that, that, that is out there. I, you know, I, I, I as a, Maybe maybe I'm just too much of a writer, but like that would have been deeply interesting to explore in a film. But um, so you know you worry about that. Uh, uh, you know that you know both my own experience and, and I think it's clearly reflected in, in my interests about about Iraq as a whole is is like you know uh, uh, what what about the Iraqis? You know not not just the not just the insurgents. Not I mean this was this is their country. That this is their place. They deserve a, a prominent place uh, in the story. And and you know ultimately it'll be up to uh, 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 this generation of storytellers, whether they're veterans or not, just if they're interested to 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 push back against that. I mean, it, uh, part of the reason Oliver Stone wrote Platoon was he was so deeply offended by the Green Berets. Uh, so uh, I have no doubt that that my screenwriter, some of my screenwriting brethren, are are fast and furiously uh, writing writing their stories about Iraq or Afghanistan, and then I, I don't think it nece they necessarily have to be veterans. Um, for my money, one of the best novels about the, about these wars is Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, which was written by Ben Fountain, who I, I finished it just assuming he was a vet because it was pitch perfect. Uh, but no, he's just a lawyer from Texas that is deeply interested in this subject and, and did the research and, and did it to get it right. And, and in some ways, like with anything, not just war, like if you, maybe it's, a little perspective can help, right? Uh, uh, maybe that step back is, is what you need. Another good example is is Stephen Crane writing The Red Badge of Courage, which for my money is, is probably the greatest offering to the American war literature canon. Uh, he, he wasn't a, a Civil War veteran. He was, uh, a, a, in the 1890s, he was, I think, a, mid, a journalist in his mid-20s that saw a generation of, of war veterans dying off and, and wanted to interview them and want, because uh, he, he thought they had interesting stories to tell, and, and, and he turned that into The Red Badge of Courage. So, uh, yeah, there are things, uh, like that, that, that bit in American Sniper or, or uh, um, you know, serial broadcasting, the, the Bo Bergdahl story uh, about the, the, the soldier who, who uh, went MIA in Afghanistan. Um, uh, although it, to, it, I, I, I fought listening to it for a while, my wife finally made me, and it's, it's, it's more nuanced than, 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 I, than I feared it was gonna be. So, uh, yeah, uh, um, I, think I, I think I got, I think I answered your question. Yeah. Uh, well, I wonder, just sort of an offshoot of that question, um, you know, I, I read a lot of book reviews of this book that this guy, David Shield, wrote. Um, you know the book? War is Beautiful. War is Beautiful. Right. Yeah. And um, so there was a lot of, you know, mixed commentary about it. And um, I just, I wonder what your opinion is of so-called war photography and um, whether or not uh, you think that it depicts war accurately, or whether it, there's censorship in America about depicting war, or whether it's, you know, we want to avoid war porn, or you know, all those kinds of things. How, where do you, how do you see that? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I think it's very related to um, the previous question, as, as, as you pointed out. I mean, uh, uh, photographs, much like books, uh, much like uh, movies, uh, people. Can't you know? It's once it's out there, people. There's an interpretive aspect to it, right? And, and, and as uh, you know, as, as the artist, you hope that you're not just reinforcing preconceived notions, right? Like like my my hope with Young Blood is that um, it, it 
it pushes against uh, all readers' preconceived notions, wherever they are on the political spectrum, wherever they are, whatever their knowledge base is of, of, of Iraq or the Iraq War. Um, but you know, we're, we're all uh, human beings, and, and uh, uh, we all like confirmation of, of something that we, of, of things that we, we believe in or, or, or want to believe in. So, uh, you know, I, there's, I haven't actually had a chance, I've seen a lot of the, like the back and forth about that book, but I haven't actually had a chance to sit down with it, so I, I can't give you a, a very educated answer, but um, uh, I, I, uh, from what I understand, uh, Shields is, part of Shields' purpose is, is kind of to uh, push against that, uh, the, the, this, the, the, the censorship uh, that's in place uh, uh, allows for a certain type of photograph Right to, to reach the newspapers, as opposed to maybe the the actual after effects. Right, that, that in the moment of some like you know uh, uh, showing a, uh, a still image of a of a, a bomb about to land in in, in uh, uh, on the Gaza Strip, is there's something you know there's something enchanting about that to the human eye, um, but that's allowed to run, whereas you know the the absolute devastation and ruin five minutes later in that very same spot. Uh, would most likely be censored by, by most American newspapers. So, you know, as, you know, as the artist, as you're creating something, you're, I, I guess I can only answer this, because I'd imagine most um, responsible photo photographers feel the same way. You know, you, you can hope that, that this is going to bring the, the reader or the viewer um, uh, uh, some more knowledge or awareness or, or all these wonderfully nuanced, deep things. But of course, you know, that, that some are, are just gonna, it's just gonna reinforce what they already believed or wanna believe. And, uh, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, once it's in their hands, you know, you can't, um, uh, that's, that's part of the interpretive act, you know? Uh, you know, I wish I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but. Um, well, I, I guess if I could just, you know, in the larger picture, do you think there's something more that can be done to communicate war to an American public that doesn't seem that interested in the one percent who are doing that fighting? Uh, other than instituting mandatory national service, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I know we're doing our best. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm fairly involved in kind of the, uh, the war writing community of, of Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the veterans and civilians, and, and yeah, I mean, some days you feel you feel you feel good about it, right? And you feel like you're reaching people uh, uh, that otherwise might not have be engaging with this, right? And and, and uh, maybe they're the they, they clicked with something, and, and uh, uh, you know they're like, you know, I'm never I'm, I'm going to go home and, and and write my congressman. It, that does happen. Often, yeah. Does it feel like we're pissing into the wind? To use that beautifully poetic Irish phrase, yeah, it does sometimes. Um, but you know. Uh, we're, you know, I'm a writer. That's 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 what I do, um, and I'm not, you know. So you write. Um, you know, the alternative would just be uh, would would be to just give up. And, and uh, I'm 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 not I'm not there uh, not there yet. Maybe ask you, you one more question. So, at the center of the book, there's this uh, love story or story of an American. Iraqi who fall in love, um, and uh, that uh, that to me seemed jarring. Although I, uh, you know, in previous wars in, in Vietnam and in Korea, we know there were there were thousands and thousands of these relationships between GIs and, and local women, um, and and their stories have their own arc and uh, tragedy to them, and um, they seem really familiar uh, from those wars. But in, to be honest, in this War, I don't think I'd ever heard of, of one before. Um, and I don't know how common it was for um, Americans to start up relationships with, um, with Iraqi civilians, although I have a sense it, it must have been quite rare, um, certainly compared to past experiences where American troops spent a lot of time in and among the local population. So A, I wanted your impression about whether I, I was right about that, and, and if I am, Right about that. I wondered why, even though this that theme is a theme that's been there in, in not just in wars, but actually war fiction about those other wars, it's it, it was unexpected in this for this war in this book. 
So I'm wondering why, uh, if I'm right, that it's kind of rare, you, you chose to make it a part of the book anyway. Uh, probably because at some point somebody told me I, could, I couldn't do it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, I had a lot of fun playing with that trope um, and, and kind of playing upon the uh, uh, the the old the old stories, uh, but uh, you know, writing a new one in, a, in an unexpected place, uh, absolutely, it absolutely was rare. Uh, but it happened just enough. Uh, you know, I, I found news articles, uh, particularly uh, from earlier in the war, a pre-surge, um, uh, but also uh, uh, um, you know, 2007 when, when we got there, uh, you know, because you started interacting with the locals more, right? Um, and, and and even just. In, in my, in my army days, like there was always a story, right? And it was always one of those stories that was always, always, you know, one, one unit away, or oh, that they, they just rotated back. He had a, he had a, he had a local local girl in town, but but they just rotated back. So you you know, almost as surely ninety nine percent of those stories were, were BS, right? Because it, you know it was one of those things. A lot of it was just you know wishful wishful thinking by by young men uh, uh, away from home for for a year. Um, but you know, it, it happens just enough uh, uh, that I thought I could do it. If, uh, that I could, if I did it right, I could do it. Uh, and also, um, it was you know, I, and I think the narrative matches this. I, I was really less interested in, in whether uh, Elijah Rios and Rana had a relationship than the idea of them having a uh, having a relationship, uh, and and how that um, uh, how that story would be told and retold, not just. Uh, uh, in the Ameri uh, from American soldier to American soldier in this town four or five years after Rios was there, but how the Iraqi people, the townspeople, would, would, would mold that story, would, 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 t would take something very basic and, and, and over the course of a couple of years turn it into their own myth, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, Rios, uh, uh, both himself, uh, uh, as it becomes a, a legendary soldier in these retellings that he could, that he could teleport from one side of town to the other, right? Uh, that that uh, uh, you know the fact that he spoke fluent Arabic uh, 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 made him so uh, so special compared to uh, 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 any other American soldier, despite uh, him being relatively low low ranking. Uh, the fact that he uh, uh, controlled the money flow for for contracts and had established a friendship with with the old sheik in town, right? Uh, so four or five years later, as, as, as uh, um, he's kind of become a legend, and and, and, and partly uh, because he's dead, right? I mean, I I, I come uh, my dad's side is an old Irish Catholic family, and, and uh, oh gosh, once you die, you are you are a saint, right? The, the stories completely change once you die. Uh, uh, my my mother's uh, of Scottish descent, so she that always that she just never quite understand that, uh, but. Uh, um, uh, so you know, you know, I kind of tapped into that a little bit of like, okay, you know, how did, how would that change the retellings of, of who this person was and, and his potential relationship uh, to to this uh, 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 you know beautiful daughter of a sheik who is uh, 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 also disappeared uh, from town. Um, so you know, I, uh, once I figured I was going to do it, um, I knew I had to do. You know, there were a lot of, all, of course, all kinds of societal and cultural. Barriers to, to ha you know how how did this happen? How do I make this happen? And you know I think the fact that I'm, you know, that we're with we are with the narrator a few years after this allegedly happened um, uh, made it work in a way that if I was writing about it on the nose in the moment, it it, it probably I don't know if it would have come up, come off the same way. So uh, but yeah, I, I found just enough news articles early on uh, of uh, uh, you know from reputable news sources. Of American soldiers uh, marrying their Iraqi girlfriends that I that I pressed forward with it. So. Is there any other questions? Well, then let's thank Matt for joining us here tonight. Thank you very much.